Hello, dear friends. It's me, Jen Roach. I'm here for another episode. Come follow me with fair, faithful answers to New Testament questions. Um, today we're going to talk about obedience. This is a fun topic. I hope you enjoy it. Um, you probably know we're going through the Come Follow Me readings, addressing some questions that kind of come up along the way that evangelicals might have about us, some questions we have about them, not trying to uh, make you fight with your evangelical friends and family members, trying to help you understand them. Um, so then maybe you can share some of your faith with them in a way that they can hear a little bit differently. Um, glad you are with us. One of my favorite things on this show has become getting to tell you about some of the cool, um, fun resources that are coming up that you may or may not know about this coming weekend. September 15 and 16, there is a um, conference from the Joseph Smith Papers. Um, it's going to be in person and online, both free. Um, if you're familiar with the Joseph Smith Papers, you probably know they are wrapping things up. This is their final conference, sort of, here's all the things that we have learned from doing this. There's, um, there's some fascinating presentations, each one sort of focused on a different aspect of the world that Joseph Smith lived in. Um, what was the socioeconomic situation like? What are the um, forces against families and women and children and um, ethnicity and politics and like just all of these things that give us a really more in-depth kind of context of how our church started. If you are a history nerd like me, you will enjoy it. You can go to their website, josephsmithpapers.org and register it's free online or in person. It's at the um, conference center in Salt Lake. Okay, we're gonna talk about obedience. Our jumping off verse is 2 Corinthians 2, 9, which says, another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. So this is Paul, he's writing to the church in Corinth. Um, we call this book Second Corinthians. It's probably his fourth official letter to them. Um, his second le letter, most likely, is what we call First Corinthians. We have the second and fourth letters, not the first and third. Um, but you can tell, even from the two letters that we do have, things are not exactly going well for them. Um, they have gotten themselves into some very precarious situations, and Paul is trying to help them out. Sometimes he's super frustrated with them. This is where we think of Paul saying, like, why can't you little freaks just be normal for five minutes? That's kind of the tagline of 2 Corinthians, um, compared to the rest of the time where he tells them how glorious and wonderful and redeemed that they that they are. Paul has two modes. Um, but here he's he is worried a bit that they are going to listen to him, that they are going to obey what he says. If you read First Corinthians, you can already see things are not going them going well, and he gives them some advice to try and unify them as a people. That's what all of First Corinthians is about, right? Um, by Second Corinthians, he has come to understand that they did not listen to his advice, at least on some aspects, and he's trying to he's trying to fix them up. Um, all of that leads us to this really interesting question. What does the phrase, you should be obedient in everything, bring up for evangelicals that's different than what it brings up for Latter-day Saints? It's, I mean, just to be honest, it's pretty complicated for them. And you can see them struggling through the best way to, to think about this stuff and You'll you'll see, we get a wide variety of what's going on. Um, as Latter-day Saints, I mean, in church we sing, um, we love to obey thy commands. And, and that's good. I actually really like that song. We sang it in church a couple of weeks ago. Um, but evangelicals get a bit weirded out around that sentiment. And it's not because they don't want to obey the commands of God. They do. Absolutely, they do, no question. They're very interested in doing that. Um, they interpret what some of those commands are a little bit differently than we do, but the underlying desire is absolutely the same. The problem 
which, which is illustrated actually rather well in that song, um, is that those commands often come through human leaders. So we sing, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet. That's praise directed to God for a variety of blessings, including the blessing of having a prophet. And evangelical ears just, their, their mind goes a lot of different directions that maybe the typical Latter-day Saint person's mind hasn't had to go. Um, so I want to talk you through all of that. We have touched on this briefly in the past, but there are some variations on this topic. I mean, I think I say that to you every single week. In this situation, they are not as much based on the different denominations or groups, but on where you fall in sort of the authority structure of that group. This is the first way we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it a, a different way in the second half. Um, so evangelicals have a, a sort of a different system for people who sit in the pews and then people who are in leadership. The average pew sitting evangelical will likely never be in a position to promise obedience to, to really anybody. Obedience to God is sort of expected. What that means, they're going to demur on, on defining that, at least at the church level. They do have membership agreements when they agree to join a certain church. Um, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. That's going to come in the back end. Um, but in general, evangelicals are they're sort of assuaged into obedience based on what the individual or the family will benefit from that obedience. Um, for example, their church starts some new program. They, the leaders want everyone to participate. The church leadership will use a lot of marketing techniques to help the people see this need. They're trying to create a need in their consumer, essentially, for this thing that they're offering, hoping that people will willingly participate. That's most likely what it is like for a pew sitting person, no matter what version of evangelicalism they're following. That's the majority. There are exceptions. We'll get to them. Um, the, there, there is quite a bit more variety in how leaders in those churches are dealt with. Now, Latter-day Saint friends, I know that you're sort of vaguely familiar with this idea that in the evangelical, in the Protestant Catholic world, um, church leadership are paid working positions. They're often full-time positions. They come with benefits. They're, it's a lifelong career for some people. Um, my experience with Latter-day Saints is generally when we talk about other clergy being paid, that's sort of what we're thinking of. The reality is there's there's actually three categories of how evangelicals manage leadership in their churches. So first is the category we've kind of already talked about, the ordained pastoral staff. Um, these are folks who went to divinity school. They've probably been through an ordination process. This is like a long-term career kind of position. Um, th these are these are good people. They're trying to spend their life serving the flock that they have been called to lead by teaching them and in, in all kinds of ways. When you think of someone who says, like, I'm a pastor, this is this is probably what you're thinking of. Second category. People who work at a church, they're sort of the, the pastoral staff, but they're not ordained. They're um, maybe they're in the process of um, doing their ordination. Maybe they're still in the process of getting their education. Um, sometimes people like this will have a, a pastoral title. They'll be the youth pastor or the children's pastor. And sometimes they use the word director to... Um, indicate this person isn't ordained. So you'd be a youth director or a children's director. Um, I was actually a children's pastor for a really long time in California, a great church, wonderful, wonderful people. Um, there's, there are all kinds of folks across the country, across the world who that's their career is they take sort of category two non-ordained positions in churches and Move, move wherever the jobs are, basically is what they're doing. The third category are folks who've been hired because they possess a skill that the church needs in order to run. Um, somebody to produce printed materials, somebody to do, keep the ground, somebody to be the accountant, right? Stuff like that. 
Mostly these are people who could be doing the same work somewhere else. They just work for a church instead. And our church, our, our Latter-day Saint church hires lots and lots and lots of these people. Um, they make the website work. They do LDS tools. People who know how to manage a warehouse. People who know how to run a farm, right? Like all these different things. We hire people to do those. Um, and in theory, those people could do that work for another employer as well. They just happen to be choosing to work for the church. So when we're talking about obedience, category two, those non-ordained folks, and category three, the skilled professionals, they're mostly compelled to obedience through the normal means that an employee is. Um, their human resources department, their employee manual, whatever that oversees their work is gonna is gonna guide a lot of that. When I was working as a children's pastor, um, our employee handbook said all employees of the church have the option of having their tithing removed directly from their check, um, or they could um, pay tithing directly, you know, as like any other congregation member would do. And at the end of the year, there would be an accounting of that to make sure that person had been given 10%. There was a scandal one year when a number of staff members were caught, caught sort of not doing that. And there was some discipline measures for them. So they're, they're in a weird mix of like employment and church faith stuff coming together. And the guardrails on that are usually the same kind of guardrails that you have on any employment situation. The category one people, those who have a formal education and are ordained, they probably have a different requirement for obedience. So I was ordained before I joined our church. Um, the ordination service included um, two things. One is called the oath of conformity and the other is called the oath of canonical obedience. That's a lot of words that just basically says you promise to do what your bishop tells you to do. A bishop in that structure is different than a bishop in the LDS structure. The idea is the same, you get ordained, you're promising to do, do what you're told basically. Um, but my experience on that is really only one end of the spectrum. Not every ordained leader is asked to take an oath of obedience. And in certain places, to be honest, the pastor sort of, ordains himself. He decides himself. He wants to start a church, um, gathers up some friends and a little bit of money, and off he goes. He has become his kind of own authority. Maybe he hooks up with a, a larger group that supports him. Maybe he doesn't. Um, there kind of isn't any requirement for that. It, it all goes down a little bit differently. Most evangelicals are not going to run across any kind of wording um, about obedience unless they're really, really paying attention to what happens in their church for how people get ordained. That's where this comes up for them. Um, what evangelicals do have is they, they call them membership agreements, sometimes membership covenants, church covenant. It can go by a lot of names. Um, but there's some interesting history here, and this is why <laughs> an evangelical today in 2023 is a little bit weirded out by the even the word obedience. I'm not even going to touch on the cultural aspects of, of why that's true. The cultural aspects impact evangelicals and Latter-day Saints probably equally. If you pay attention to culture at all, you probably can already imagine what those are. I'm not going to go into those. So a membership agreement is traditionally exactly what it sounds like. An individual signs something to say they agree with the doctrine of a particular church, and that document probably says something about the expectation that they participate, they should be in the life of the church, they should have tithes and offerings, they should obey the scriptures. That That's sort of traditionally what these looked like. And there would probably be that'd probably be pretty straight across the board, late 40s into the 50s. By the time you get to the late 60s, though, I mean, just like with all of society, things are changing. And that kind of membership agreement was seen as too legalistic, as too controlling. 
So church has mostly moved away from specifics into something that just sort of signs the person up for membership without there really being any requirements. Um, or, or even more likely, to be honest, they just get rid of membership altogether and just say, if you attend, you're a member, good enough, call it good. It, around the year 2000, um, if you go if you go back to the early episodes of this podcast, we talked through the whole like kind of scope of history for evangelicals. Around the year 2000, evangelicals really started to think about church membership kind of differently. There's a huge resurgence of um, Calvinist or Reformed churches during that era. It was the biggest, most popular thing. The vibe of these churches was very hipster, very slick, urban, young. Um, absolutely, they had a rock band on stage. Um, the the whole the whole deal. Um, in the past on this show, I've told you the history of Mars Hill Church in Seattle, which at one point was the largest church in America. It, for at many points, it was the fastest growing church before it blew up in spectacular fashion. Uh, but Mars Hill is sort of the epitome of this time in evangelical history. These are folks who wanted to say, with really, really good motives, I think, and it's going to sound really weird to your Latter-day Saint ears, but what they wanted to say is that God hates humans. He thinks we're disgusting worms. We are not his children at least until we um, enter into a relationship with Christ. And then God kind of looks away from all of our disgustingness and adopts us as his child. And in these churches where there was a big resurgence of them around the 2000s, the faithful response to this was kind of take it like a man. Like, this is what God is like. Do you want to worship him or not? And if you do, you have got to accept this really, really hard truth that just in and of yourself, God hates you. Any softening of that was sort of seen as, as weak faith. So these reformed churches are revitalizing the practice of church membership as part of this whole package of, yeah, we're young and hip, but we're also going to be super, super hardcore doctrinally. So they start... Um, the practice of church membership sort of gets a, a reboot right here. And, and in the end, they take it to some ridiculous lengths, as you might imagine. Instead of being a simple statement between a church and a member about their beliefs, what happens is it morphs into a legal contract. Um, here, here's the history. Churches were trying to practice some form of church discipline, Usually these kind of hardcore God hates you churches, um, they would want to keep members accountable for behavior, which is a good thing. They were getting sued by people in their churches who they were trying to discipline for defamation character. Let me read you a quote. It's from an attorney very familiar with all of this. He says, when a church begins the process of exercising formal biblical discipline, it will often receive a letter from a member's attorney threatening to sue the church for defamation, invasion of privacy, an intentional infliction of emotional distress. Many church leaders who would not back down have found themselves forced into courts, subjected to cross-examination, and shocked to see juries penalize their churches with six-figure damage awards. This trend was triggered by a case in 1984, which resulted in a $400,000 judgment and it has grown from there. So evangelical churches have more and more reframed the idea of church membership. And on one side, they have completely given up the idea. We just want you to come and learn and be with us. We make no demands on obedience for you. Or they go the other direction and have morphed membership into a legal contract, sometimes even requiring members to sign a non-disclosure agreement regarding all church issues. Sometimes Latter-day Saints, um, they really get criticism for the secrecy that we have in the temple. Um, 
modern evangelical churches, it's not unusual for them to want a member to sign a non-disclosure agreement, even if that member has not been an employee. So secrecy, secrecy exists kind of everywhere. Um, and I don't have a study to point to that says this. My own estimate right now would be probably 65, 70% of churches have very low key membership or none at all. There's no expectation placed on people who attend. They're treated like customers. The staff is there to keep them happy. If your town has some slick giant mega church, probably goes by the name, the well, Elevation Church, the Rock Church, something cool. They're likely using this model. Church members are customers and customer service by the pastors is the highest priority. Making people feel good about being there is the highest priority. Probably 35, 40% of evangelical churches are trying some kind of membership agreement, which may or may not include phrasing about obedience. The ones that do contain words about obedience are probably leaning towards the legal contract side of things because they got tired of being sued. There, there are also some rare churches, but it has been well publicized, where they're doing some really sneaky things. Marcel Church in Seattle is, is, the, is the best example of this that I know of. They drafted their membership agreement so that, in reality, the church only had three members. They had 40,000 people who attended or something like that on Sundays. But those people, no matter how involved they were, were not considered members. Those members had signed a contract saying that they had no rights to anything. The only three members of the church, the senior pastor and the top two board members, are the ultimate authority, the ones who have the final word. They should be obeyed above, above all else. The only ones who decide what happens, attendees have no ability to influence that at all, ever. Even other evangelical churches absolutely um, hammered on Marcel Church when this became public of this is what they were doing. This is not the norm. This is a, a, a very sneaky, in my opinion, unethical, in other evangelical churches' opinions, non-biblical way that they handled this. And and. I mean, frankly, evangelicals are not stupid people. They hear stories like this and they get suspicious that membership is a trick or a trap. And they sort of revert back to their hyper-independence of wanting relationship just to be between them and God and nobody else ever gets to say anything about it, including about obedience. All of that to say, the word obedience is really, really loaded for evangelicals. It's either become a, a dirty word that has been eliminated, except in the most basic sense of obeying scripture, or it's been it's been hyped up into the realm of contracts and law. Um, it's probably going to take another 20 years, pro probably more before evangelicals can even begin to kind of find a sensible stance on this again. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Between 2000 and 2023, an incredible amount of damage has been done, not only to the concept of obedience, but the concept of what does it even mean to be a member in a church? They're all still, still sort of reeling from that. And it's going to, it's understandably going to take them a minute to get that figured out. Um, let's briefly contrast this with what we believe in our church. Um, our, our belief is we came to this earth in part to prove our willingness to obey a father that we can no longer see and can't remember. It's, it's Abraham 325. We will prove them herewith to see if they will all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. We covenant to obey the law of obedience. It's not a it's not blind obedience. At, at one point in my investigation of the church, I really had this true fear that having a prophet actually meant that some guy I never knew could tell me what to do, and I would literally have no choice except for to have to do it. That's what like as an evangelical investigating the church, learning about the importance of obedience, that was the 
only way I could conceptualize it in my mind, at least at first. But the law of obedience is not God trying to legally force us to comply with his, his dominance, with his will. It's inviting us to come unto him. And, and we need to make any choice we want to make about that. Absolutely, you are completely free to make any choice. God asks you to come to him. You very legitimately can say no. All choices have consequences. That there are literally no consequence free choices in any aspect of life. But obedience is not compelled. It's not compelled through domination. It's not compelled through, through the secular courts. In our church, it's seen as a voluntary act of faith. We, at least on our best days, we see that obedience can and does lead to happiness evangelicals have had a really rough go on this topic and even the word obedience is going to bring up a lot of division much of which we don't even have time to cover here it's not a word most of them would associate with happiness so when we say law of obedience their brains go to i'm going to be compelled i'm going to be forced I did all kinds of sneaky or bad things could happen here. Um, if you would like to go further in depth on this particular point, I highly recommend to you the YouTube channel called Temple Light. My friend Jasmine talks through all things temple in a very plain spoken and direct way. Um, her episode called The Law of Obedience is a great video to watch after this one. And Jasmine is much more efficient than I am. She can make her point in 10 minutes. It takes me 25, so here we are. But that video will help you to think about why obedience has been played out in our church the way that it has and why we're able to think of obedience and happiness in the same sentence in a really actual authentic way. Okay, next week, we're gonna talk about the three levels of heaven and why evangelicals think we are crazy to believe such a thing, talk about how they view it instead, contrast that with what we believe, try and find a way to talk about. It'll be great fun. See you then.